We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church family. This is the, 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 the group that shows up on a rainy day like this morning, you know, you, you long to be here, you want to be here. I'm really glad that you're here. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor, and I'm really glad you're here. Uh, I, would, I would love to meet you in person after, after services. I usually hang out in the, the, the lobby area, so let's uh, bump fists. We probably shake hands, whatever you, you know, side hug, whatever you want, right? Uh, we we uh, probably won't, won't gather and meet outside today, like, like sometimes, but it's, yeah, it's kind of wet and rainy and dreary out there. Hey, I wanted to draw your attention to a couple of things before we get into the message today. One, last week, hopefully you had a chance to fill out our biannual survey. If you didn't, uh, make sure you grab one today at the Next Steps counter or on your way out and you can fill this out. We want everyone to fill it out one time. So if you already filled it out last week, you're done, all right? Don't fill it out again. Um, Just fill one of those out and let us know how we're doing because that's going to all, all that data we're gathering together and on October 2nd, it's a Sunday morning, I want to make sure that you're planning on being here on October 2nd for Vision Sunday. It's going to be an incredible day. Everyone in attendance, regardless of your age, will get uh, an Arundel Christian Church shirt. It's going to be a really cool thing. So you want to make sure you're planning on being here. It, it, you can't grab one for your friend, right? You're, oh, you know, so-and-so, they decided to stay home this morning. Can I get one from them? Nope. All right, so uh, you can buy one the next Sunday. They'll be available for sale. So if you want one, make sure you're here that Sunday. It's going to be a really great uh, Sunday. And right after that, we're going to have our party in the parking lot, which is going to be a really great thing. Um, so don't, don't miss that. Another thing I want to make sure that you know about is this Saturday and Sunday, we have our Go Weekend. It's going to be an incredible opportunity for you to serve this community. So this Saturday, uh, make sure you go to our website for more information to get signed up and all that, but we're going to go out and blanket our community. We're going to cover our community in service on Saturday. And on that Sunday, right after church next Sunday, we're going to split up into prayer groups and we're going to meet at different places throughout our community and spend us a, a little bit of time uh, walking around different parts of the Glen. Bernie area and praying over our community. So you want to be a part of next weekend. It's our our serve day is on Saturday and our prayer focus day is on Sunday. Uh, It's going to be an incredible weekend. Make sure you don't miss it. If ACC is your church family, let's do this together. It's going to be incredible. All right, so hey, we're, we're starting a brand new series today called The Blessed Life. And I want to specifically uh, highlight the, the truth that the series we just ended, right? We were talking about the wander years, and we ended with Joshua uh, kind of getting a charge from God as he's going into the promised land. And if you remember how that charge ended, I'm going to tie these series together. In Joshua 1, 7 through 8, it said, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Then it says this, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Then it says this, only then will you prosper and succeed in what? Everything you do. I mean, I don't know about you, but twice in this charge, Right, God says to Joshua, listen, when you stay focused on doing what this book leads you to do, when you spend time studying this book and learning this book and then obeying this book and teaching this book, when you do that, only then will you be able to live this thing called the blessed life, this this life that's filled with blessing. Now, I want to be really up uh, forthcoming with this. This this series, it's going to be, we're going to be in three weeks in this series. And it, it all, a lot of the content is borrowed from a book. Another pastor at Gateway Church named Robert Morris did a series called The Blessed Life. 
And we, we loved the content from the series so much that we're, we're gathering a lot of the this kind of the same scripture passages and kind of teaching through them our own way. Um, but one of the things we wanted to make available is we do have some copies of this book in case somebody wants to dig a little bit deeper into this content. It's an incredible book. Uh, we will have a, a, f- a handful of these copies available in Next Steps if anybody wants to buy one and dig a little deeper. Um, Mac gave me two and said that I don't have to give them back. So that means one for this service. Uh, let me see whose hand goes up first. All right, I saw one right here which makes it easy. All right, there's your copy. I don't know how much we're charging for them. They didn't, nobody told me, but I'm sure it's at cost. So make sure you grab one if you'd like. All right. So ultimately this concept of the blessed life and, and borrowing a lot from this, this other series at, at Gateway Church, we want to look through what it looks like to live a life that's blessed. What does that word mean? It gets tossed around a lot in our culture, doesn't it? This concept of a blessed life. Notice it's, no, we're not talking, this isn't a series on a blessed wallet. We're not talking about a blessed pocketbook. In fact, I want to be really clear that at Arundel Christian Church, there's, uh, there's some extremes that sometimes people take when it comes to the blessings that Christians should be able to expect. And one, one extreme that I think is very dangerous is teaching what I call a prosperity gospel which is that if you, if you do what God wants you to do, and if you study this book, and if you, if you give generously, and if you do that, then, then God plans to bless you with incredible financial wealth, and he plans to bless you with incredible physical health, and he plans to bless you with kind of health and wealth. And while God certainly can do that, and he certainly does do that from time to time, I don't know about you, but when I study this book, I see people who've committed their lives to following Jesus, people like John the Baptist, who lost his head for sticking to the teaching of this book. I think of like the original disciples, right? 11 out of the 12 were martyred for their faith. And I don't know about you, but when I look at that, I'm like, that doesn't sound like a really blessed life that a lot of churches are teaching and preaching these days. To me, it sounds like that when you actually understand this book and understand what what uh, blessings look like, that it's not necessarily going to come in the form of a financial blessing or a, a physical health blessing. So then what does blessed mean? If we're a church that's talking about living and having a blessed life, what does that mean? I know the way a lot of us use the hashtag, right? If you ever want to to brag about something that you have on social media, right? You just have to put hashtag blessed after it and you can get away with it, right? I got this brand new car. I want everyone to see it, hashtag blessed. <laughs> My kids are awesome, hashtag blessed, right? I and mean, it's, it's something that sometimes we just use as a way to kind of get around bragging about things that God's done in our lives. And those aren't neat blessings, right? When your kid succeeds in something or you're able to enjoy something that maybe a vacation you've been saving up for. That, that's a cool blessing. I get it. But is that what blessed means? And what I really want to point out this morning and throughout this series is that a blessed life is not so much about getting as much as it is about giving. And you're going to see that pattern throughout Scripture. If you want to really understand what a blessed life looks like, it's not so much about measuring the, the quantity of your getting as much as it is about your giving and your generous heart. In in Acts 20, Jesus said it this way. He says, it is more blessed, there it is, the word blessed, to give than to receive. If you really want to experience a blessed life, according to Jesus, who clearly we can, we can count on, he's saying if you really want to experience a blessed life, it's going to be uh, easier to experience blessings when you're giving than when you're getting. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And then Jesus didn't just say it. These weren't just words for him. In fact, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. I mean, if anybody understands what it means to be a generous person and to give everything they've got, it's Jesus Christ who gave his life for you on the cross. You see, I believe that giving is ultimately a matter of the heart. And what I want to explore this morning, in fact, if we were to give this message a title, it would be this, it's all about the heart. What you have to do is get to a point where you can examine and look at and see how our hearts are attached to the concept of giving. 
And when I say giving, by the way, some of you right now just immediately went to, oh, Matt's talking about money. Money is the way that we immediately think when we, when we hear someone talk about giving. We usually think about financial giving. And that makes sense. That is a way that we give. That's usually the way when, when you're giving something to someone else, it's usually something you either bought with money or you, you handed over money. But we can give a lot of things, right? We can be generous with our, our time. We can be generous with our resources. We can lend out and allow other people to use things that, that we recognize are God's and not ours. We can be generous in so many different ways. So I don't want you to just get locked in on this money thing. But ultimately, what I do want you to see is our generosity is tied to our heart. Robert Morris, when he talks about this concept about it being tied to his heart, he, he talks about how he's noticed that our hearts, there's actually a string between our hearts and our wallet. He's like, I know it because every time people reach for their wallet, it's always like, oh, you know, like it's this connection, right? Our, 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 our wallets and our, our, our ability to be generous with our time and our, our, our talents and our resources, those things are tied so closely to our heart. And we see that all throughout Scripture. In fact, I'll, I'll show you an example of that. In Matthew 6, it says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Wherever your treasures are, or the things that are most important to you, the places where you've stored up things that are important to you, right? Maybe, maybe that is financial. Maybe that's a talent or a resource or something you own. Uh, wherever those things are, you, you can usually see where someone's heart is at. I downloaded an app a couple years ago. There was a few people in my, my life group, and we decided to kind of have this kind of I don't know, kind of an unofficial challenge where we downloaded this app called Robin Hood. And we each put like $100 in there. And it was kind of on, on different Fridays we'd get together for Robin Hood, by the way. It's a way to, to kind of buy and sell, like day trade some stocks. So it was just kind of a fun little task for us. And you'd, you'd put some money in a stock and then you'd watch what happened. And the next Friday, we would compare notes to see who was up and who was down, who was better at handling their small little Robin Hood investment. I'll tell you what, the stocks that I would buy, uh, and I'd, you know, I would never go into Google or, or Yahoo Finance or whatever and look at how those businesses were doing before that app. And all of a sudden now I'm like, how's Tesla doing? You know, how's Apple doing? How's whatever? And I'd, I'd be, I'd, all of a sudden my mind was captivated by the success of these businesses because I had some money, I had some treasure tied up in them. If you really want to see where your heart is at, you're going to see what's taking up your attention, where you're spending a lot of energy and focus, because our hearts are attached to our generous spirit. One of the ways that Robert Morris, again, the pastor at Gateway, says this, I love this quote, he says, if you want to put your heart in the kingdom, you've got to put your treasure in the kingdom. If you want to know where your heart is and you want your heart in the kingdom, it says wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So if you want to put your heart in the kingdom, if you want to put your heart in eternal things, you're going to invest your treasure in eternal things. So let me show you how this works out and why I think this is so closely connected to the heart. If you grab a copy of God's Word, if you have one with you, that's great. Always get in the habit of bringing a Bible with you to church. Turn to Deuteronomy 15. Deuteronomy 15. If you're new to the Bible or you don't have one, I want to invite you to go ahead and grab the Bible from the chair in front of you, and you can put your name in it if you don't own a copy of God's Word, and you can keep that, okay? But it's the first five books of the Bible, Math, or Matthew, that's the New Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy. So the fifth book of that Bible that you're holding in your hands is Deuteronomy, and turn all the way to the 15th chapter of Deuteronomy. We're going to spend some time there. And what we're going to see is that generosity, this concept of living a blessed life, that this blessed life of generosity comes and is attached so closely to being a heart issue. If you look at, let's start at verse 7. It says this, but if there are any poor Israelites in your towns, when you arrive in the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard, what? hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards them. Instead, be generous and lend them whatever they need. 
You're going to notice that word hard-hearted and tight-fisted. These are examples of, of kind of connecting our, our physical body to, to this concept of generosity and to blessing. My, uh, my mom, many of you know this, right? She passed away when I was very young. I was a sophomore in high school when my mom died suddenly of a heart attack. And trying to understand exactly what happened, because my mom appeared healthy. She had passed, you know, all her physicals, and she wasn't, you know, overweight or anything. She just seemed like a normal 41-year-old woman. And for her to all of a sudden die suddenly from a heart attack, obviously we had some questions for the doctor. And the, one of the things the doctor said is, listen, we, we think because there's some genetics that could be at play here that you and your brother and your sister should probably do some sort of regular heart checkup. More regularly than most people, uh, we recommend getting a cardiologist wherever you live and, and going in every once in a while doing a stress test because the type of uh, heart disease my mom had would have been highlighted in a stressful environment. And that usually means, by the way, and you guys know how much I hate running, running on a treadmill while they're checking out the, the strength of your heart. But what they're ultimately doing, right, when somebody's checking the strength of your heart is they're looking at different things. They're looking at, you know, whether or not there's blockages and whether or not maybe your, your blood pressure's too high or too low. They're going to look at whether or not your heart's beating in rhythm. That's something that's important. They're going to see if your heart's too big or too small for what it's supposed to be. All those things are going to highlight if there's a problem with your heart. So as I was thinking through, I mean, it's great when another pastor has kind of already written a sermon for you. But I don't enjoy that very much. I don't want to just listen to another pastor preach a message and say, I'm just going to copy that. So I was like, what can I do to really kind of take some of the concepts from Deuteronomy 15 and, and teach it in a way that we might be able to grab onto it? And I wanted to do it in a kind of a creative way. And what we're going to do is we're each going to get a heart, a stress test, if you will. If you want to examine, right, if you want to examine the strength of your faith you need to do a stress test on your heart. So what we're going to do today is we're going to run. I'm just kidding. We're not, no, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. We are going to run spiritually and mentally through a passage of Scripture, and we're going to see what it says as we examine those four areas of our heart health. The first one, you can write this down on your, your, your notes, is we're going to look for some blockages. We're going to see if, if, in the, if our blessed life is tied to generosity, if generosity is tied to our heart, then let's look and see if there's anything that's blocking things, right? It says when your heart, uh, when your heart hangs on to things it's not supposed to, you get a blockage, right? When there's an artery that's, that's clogging up, it's because something that's not supposed to be there is sticking. And ultimately what happens for us when it messes up our ability to be people who are generous, uh, when our heart is, 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 it's when it, our heart is hanging on to things that our heart's not meant to hang on to. It's when our heart is hanging on to the wrong things. You'll notice in that passage it said, don't be hard-hearted or tight-fisted. When I think of tight-fisted, I had a, um, a cousin named Rod, and he drove a, a semi-truck for a living. Long distant uh, type, type drives. And he taught me one day, he's like, if you're ever out driving and it's late at night and you got to get through the night, but you're feeling a little bit tired, we actually have a trick in the trucking world. What you do is you take a $100 bill out of your pocket and you put it between two fingers and you roll down the window and you hold it out the window. <laughs> he said, you will stay awake. <laughs> you're not going to sleep. Not with $100 out at stake, right? I mean, it's kind of this, this con. I thought that was genius. I've never actually tried it. Um, I'm like, I don't trust my grip, you know? Like, but, but man, I imagine that you'd be pretty, you'd hang on pretty tight, right? You'd be really tight-fisted because we don't like to let something that we believe is ours go. We like to hang on to things. And what Scripture is saying here is to make sure you're not hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards people who have a need. In fact, the word, if you, in our, in our next service is our, our ASL interpreting service for those who have a hard time hearing, right? We have the ability to communicate with our hands. And there's an, the American sign language for the word sacrifice. I love this. You start with kind of a tight-fisted motion. You start with your hands closed, 
And when you sacrifice, you say the word sacrifice, it's, it's opening up your hand and releasing upwards. I love that. Can you do that with me? The sacrifice, tight-fisted into just giving it away. And that's what sacrifice is. That's what this, this concept of recognizing that when you have a blockage, what it means is that you're hanging on to things that you're not supposed to be hanging on to, and the, the flow of blessing, the way it's supposed to work through you, is getting stopped up because you're hanging on to stuff that you were never meant to hang on to. So let's keep reading in verse 9 of Deuteronomy 15. It says, Do not be mean-spirited and refuse someone alone because the year of canceling debts is close at hand. I'll talk about that in just a moment. If you refuse to make the loan and the needy person cries out to the Lord, you will be considered guilty of sin. So what Scripture here is saying is essentially let go of selfishness. Let go of your greed. And he talks about do not refuse to make a loan. Uh, but specifically saying uh, when that year of canceling debts is close at hand. There's actually this, this concept in the Old Testament called the year of Jubilee. And every seven years, the concept was that debt, any debt, anybody who owed anyone else debt on that seventh year, the year of Jubilee, the debt was canceled. How many of you would love to bring that back up, right? And like, let's... Come on, just one year of Jubilee, just one, right? I, that'd be a pretty great thing. I'm not going to make any political statements right now, but this year of Jubilee, yeah, you can imagine, right, if someone, if you knew that every debt, every loan you give out right now, the year of Jubilee's coming like in two weeks, you're like, oh, I don't know if it's the right time to loan out any money, right? Because in two weeks, it's going to be forgiven, and essentially what Moses is saying here in Deuteronomy through the sermon, what God is telling us is, listen, just because you know that there's a chance that when you lend out something, it might not come back, that's not a reason not to be a generous person. One of the best lessons my dad ever taught me is every time you lend out money, tell yourself it's a gift. If you don't get it back, it won't bug you. If you have to have it, don't lend it. <laughs> I mean, like if, if, you're, if you can't go on without whatever, then, I mean, if you, you got to be able to, willing to give it away. And if you get it back, great. And essentially just learn to, to be generous. The New King James Version says a uh, different, different wording in verse 9. It says, beware lest there be a wicked thought in your heart. See, that wicked thought is that blockage that's keeping the blessing of God from flowing out through you into someone else who might have a greater need. I want to ask you a quick question. If, you were to, if I were to ask you, why did God create the concept of giving? In fact, if you ask most people, if you were to just go out on the street and say, why does God ask us to give? Why does He ask us to give financially? Why does He ask us to give of our time? Why does He ask us to give of our resources? You know what the, the, probably the most popular answer is, and probably what most of us kind of the natural inclination that comes to our brain is something that sounds like this. It's so that we can support the work, so we can support His work. I really want you to think about that answer for a moment. Do you really think God needs your money to do what He wants to do? I mean, is there, is, seriously, is there, I mean, maybe the light bill in heaven's really big, and He's just like, man, I hope that people give because a light bill is just too much for me to pay. Maybe they're just, there's a gold shortage and there's paving more roads in heaven, and so they really need us to be able to give, right? But no, God doesn't need our money. He doesn't need our talents. He doesn't need our resources. So it, it's, it's not that there's a shortage and God is just hoping for us to, to give, right? Listen, God did not create giving for his sake. He created it for your sake. I don't want you to miss that. God doesn't need anything from you, but he invites us to, to, he knows that our hearts are tied so, you know, so tightly to our, our generosity and our faith that he's saying, listen, I want to teach you how to live this blessed life. And one of the ways you do that is by opening up your hands and learning not to have a blockage that's keeping blessing from moving through you into someone else. In fact, here's another kind of one-liner, giving 
more than anything else, works selfishness and greed out of your lives. Giving more than anything else removes those blockages from your heart that make you a greedy and selfish person. I'm not a big fan of sermons that say, hey, if you give, you're going to get. Because then what we do is that doesn't really work out selfishness in our spirits. We just start giving so that we can get. The truth is that we just give because it makes us more like our Savior. And it's the key and path into a blessed life. All right, let's go into our second thing on our heart checklist. Not only would they check your heart for blockages, but they're also going to check your whole cardiovascular system for your blood pressure. They're going to make sure that your blood pressure is kind of in a a reasonable range, that your blood pressure is where it needs to be. And I want to show you how I believe this is tied to, to generosity. I mean, think about this for a moment. I have no doubt in my mind that if someone put a blood pressure cuff on my arm and tested me on a regular old, you know, Friday, right when paycheck, you know, just kind of hit the bank, and I mean, I'd be all right. I'm, I, my blood pressure is always going to be a little high, okay? It'd be between me and my doctor, right? Leave, stay out of it. But my blood pressure is a little high, all right? So it's going to be a little high. But if you then tested it as I was writing like a mortgage payment check, which I don't write, still write checks. I don't know why. I, yeah, but when, you know, we were sending in a large chunk of money. You're investing in something or you're writing that, that tithe check. And to have someone take your blood pressure right at that moment, what you're going to see is that your, your blood pressure goes up a little bit. You're going to see that it causes something in you to kind of, uh, the, way, the way Robert Morris puts it, it causes what's called like a, a grieving heart. Every month, my daughter's, their, their dance tuition bill is due. And if you want to see my blood pressure at its highest, it's on that day. (laughs) Let's keep reading. In Deuteronomy 15, verse 10, it says, Give generously to the poor, not grudgingly, for the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. You see again how your heart is tied to, the blessing, excuse me, is tied to a heart of generosity. Give generously to the poor. And this word, not grudgingly. Another way to say that is not with a grieving heart. Here's what would cause a grieving heart. A grieving heart would be brought up when I give away something and it's now gone and I recognize that I don't get it back, right? It causes us to grieve the loss of what we just gave away, right? But if someone ran up here this morning, right, and if I just told someone that I, I, I'm really hungry this morning and I really, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm looking forward to lunch, but I, have, I don't have any money. And if someone heard that and they said, you know what, I want to fix that and just ran up here right now with 20 bucks, that would be pretty cool, right? Now, I'm not asking anybody to do that. Listen, if you saw someone run up here with 20 bucks, you would be like, wow, that was really nice to that person. They were just really generous, and they they sacrificed, and they gave up some money so that Pastor Matt could go to Mission Barbecue after service. But what if I then told you that they were actually just repaying a loan, and it just was a really weird time for them to do it, right? That I'd given them $20 yesterday, and it was that moment that they were just coming up and giving me the money back. Like, that would change your opinion of what had just happened, right? Because it's not hard to give away something when all you're doing is giving back to a person who lent to you. If, if, if someone in here had my money, if I gave you $100 before service started and I said, listen, sometime during the service, come and give it to me. If, if that happened, you guys would think, wow, someone just gave $100. But the truth is, in that moment, I would know that they're not grieving it at all because I gave it to them and told them to give it to me. It was my money to start with. And the truth is that when we understand that we are to give not grudgingly or not with a grieving heart, what it means simply is that we are called to give back what's not ours. And we get that concept. When we understand we're just giving back something that was never ours to begin with, it causes us to not have a grieving heart because we're not giving away something that we think is ours. You see, selfishness attacks us before we give and grief attacks us after we give. 
Have you ever noticed that when you commit to giving something, it's always at that moment that something in your house seems to break, right? You say, hey, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this gift to a missionary. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support this cause. I'm going to whatever. And the moment you give that money away or the moment you commit to, to giving or serving with your time or your talent or resources, in that moment, like, you know what, hey, we got two cars around here, and I know you, you need one, so I'm going to lend out my car to you. It's in that moment that my other car breaks, right? It's in that moment I realize, okay, now I've got no cars. Because what happens is Satan wants to cause you a grieving heart every time you give. Because what happens, if he can confuse you, that every time you're generous, that it causes grief inside of you, that it causes pain inside of you, it's going to make you a selfish person. So this blood pressure issue, right? If, if, if your blood pressure is really high every time you give, it might be a sign of a lack of health. Let's keep, uh, let me show you uh, a verse in Psalm 24, verse 1. Stay right where you're at in Deuteronomy 15, but in Psalm 24, it says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. See, here's what happens. If we recognize that that's true, if we look at that verse and recognize that everything that we have is God's, the talent that you have is God's. The car you drove in today is God's. The, 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 the money in your bank, it's God's. The paycheck you get on Fridays or whenever you get it, right? It's, it's, it's all His. And when you recognize that, what it does is it brings your blood pressure back down. It allows you to give, not grudgingly, but willingly, because you realize you're not giving anything. You're just giving back what was not yours to begin with. Does that make sense? All right, here's the, the third thing that we're going to check for our heart health is our rhythm. You know, if I were to go in to see my cardiologist and they would see that my heart rate wasn't beating in rhythm, that I have some sort of arrhythmia, that would be a sign that there's something wrong, that something needs to be fixed. Just a kind of a fun fact here, you know, the average heart is supposed to beat somewhere between 60 to 100 beats per minute at a resting heart rate. If you want to know what your, your kind of maximum heart rate should be when you're exercising, kind of a fun thing, you take 220 and then you subtract your age, all right? So you take 220 and then whatever, however old you are, and you subtract that, and that's kind of like the, the, the rate at which your heart is supposed to beat while you're exercising. That's kind of the maximum range that you kind of want to be in between. But it's not only how fast your heart is beating. What a doctor is going to want to check is that your heart is beating with an even number of space between each of your beats. Because if you're like, heart is bum, 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 that's not good, right? You want to have kind of a rhythm to your heartbeat. And, and, and the way the rhythm is tied into a generous life is very important as well. So let's, let me show you how rhythm is tied in here. In Deuteronomy 15, verse 14, it says, Give him a generous farewell gift from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Share with him some of the bounty with which the Lord your God has blessed you. Have you ever noticed that generosity usually is, is kind of the, the moments of your generosity come in a rhythmic season? One of the ways I see that in my home, and I hope you see it in yours, is that when we get paid on a regular basis, right, our paycheck comes in in regular intervals, and our hearts want to beat in a, in a generous rhythm so that we are also, we choose to be generous in that same rhythm. As money comes in of our first fruits, we give back a tithe to our church. We, we make sure that and maybe in, in the area of service, if you serve here at ACC, you're probably going to realize that you get put on the calendar in some sort of rhythmic way. It's not like, hey, we want you to serve one time here and we'll call you next April, right? No, it's usually like, hey, I serve once a month or, or I serve every other week or I serve uh, uh, the first service every week, whatever it is, there's some sort of rhythm to it. You see, God's calling us to, to check on the rhythm of our generosity because if your heart isn't beating in rhythm, there might be a problem with you experiencing the blessed life. 
There's another ASL word I'm going to teach you today. It's the word generous. And the word generous, actually, you see the rhythm in it. So now take your hands and kind of open hands, right? And you're going to roll out like you're giving away. I don't know if I'm quite doing it right. I'll find out next service. But here's the point. You see how there's a rhythm. There's a cycle to it. And if you realize that, you know what, I'm generous every once in a while. I'm generous with no real rhythm in between my generosity and the way I serve with my time or serve with my money or serve with my talents. Then there's probably an arrhythmia, a heart issue that you might need to explore. You'll notice in that verse, right, it's, it's when the, the, the wheat from the threshing floor or when the wine presses, I mean, those are all seasons of harvest. It's when, you know, when the harvesting season happens, there's a generous heart that comes out of that. It's, there's, there's a seasonal rhythm. It's this incredible thing that, that we, we learn from, from childhood that we have a hard time figuring out generous spirits, don't we? Like we, when we watch our kids, they have to learn how to be generous with their things. You have a child, right, who's playing with a toy, and then a new kid comes in and starts playing with another toy. And what does that kid do? Drops that toy and runs over, right, and says, I was playing with that, and I was playing with that. And the other kid says, okay, that looks better anyway. So they go over and start, no, no, I was playing with that. And then they're gathering up all the toys. and they're, Like, this is just kind of natural in us. We don't like to share our things. And remember that when we take these heart checks and we're checking our for blockages, and we're checking our blood pressure, and we're checking for rhythm. These are things that are going to help us see where we have some, some work to do if our heart is not healthy. I love how in this verse, this, this next verse, let me, let me show you. In Deuteronomy 8, 18, it says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. You see, we recognize that everything that we have is God's, right? But not only the things we have are God's, but the continued acquirement of new things. It says, God is the one, it says, for it is he who gives you power to get new things, to acquire new talents, to be able to have more time, to be able to serve. God is the one who blesses you with those things. And as those things come in rhythmically, we need to learn to be generous rhythmically. Otherwise, you have an arrhythmia. All right, here's the last one in our heart health checklist. Is they're going to check the size of your heart. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This one is kind of backwards. This, this, this illustration, i got to squeeze it a little bit, all right? Here's the point. If you have an enlarged heart when you go see your cardiologist, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing, All right? So here's where the, the analogy breaks down. I'm gonna suggest to you that heart health, as far as what we're concerned when it comes to living a blessed life, that the bigger your heart, the better. We're gonna check to make sure that when it comes to your, your generous spirit and your, your steps of faith, that you have a big heart. And we're going to see that as we keep reading in verse 15. I love this. It says, remember that you were once slaves in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I'm giving you this command. Do you see how Moses ties this together? What I mean by having this concept of a big heart is really just having a heart of gratefulness. It's having a heart of gratitude. It's having a heart that recognizes the reason Moses is saying when someone else has a need, remember that God has met all of your needs. When somebody else, listen, sometimes it's, it's, it's so mind-blowing to me how someone will be in a church for years and years and years and never take an opportunity to say, you know what, I want to serve in that church. Even though the whole time you've been in attendance, people have been hanging out with your kids, pouring the love of Jesus into them, helping you with your coffee, holding the door, holding the umbrella over your head, all these things. It's like people have been serving you and serving you and serving you. And instead of having a spirit and attitude of gratefulness of saying, I want to be a part 
but even less than what other people have done for you, think about the ultimate gift and the ultimate sacrifice that has ever been made for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for you. And what God is saying here to, to, through Moses to the people, listen, don't forget that I pulled you out of oppression in Egypt and I brought you into the promised land. Don't forget that because when you remember that, it will enlarge the size of your heart and you will be able to give generously. You won't worry about giving because you'll know all the blessings you have are from God. And the same is true of us if we recognize that God is good and he's been good to us and he saved us from an eternity in hell and is offering us an eternity in relationship with him in heaven, then it's got to change our hearts. It's going to grow the size of our hearts. You need to remember that all, you need to remember all that God has done for you and in you and through you. There was a, a pastor's wife, I heard this story, a, a pastor's wife and, and the pastor were out at, at dinner and they had talked, uh, it shared an example or an illustration recently about how they had a house that they gave away to someone in the church. A house that they gave away. And somebody came up to this pastor's wife and said, like, are you, are you like, how did you feel when your husband just gave away a house? She said, I, I feel amazing. She said, I... My husband used to be hooked in, into drugs and lost, like it used to be like all living a, a worldly life, pursuing women and drugs and money and all sorts of things that weren't bringing him happiness. And then he found Jesus and Jesus changed him. And then she said this phrase, I loved it. He has never gotten over being saved. He said, answer, have you... Have you lost the, the incredible, just the, 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 the incredible everything that is Jesus saved you? If that has like gone over your head and you've, you've kind of missed out on that, what it's going to cause is it's going to cause you to be a selfish and greedy person who hangs on to the stuff you have because you lack the gratitude to allow it to, to grow the size of your heart and you're going to miss out on what we're going to be talking about this series called The Blessed Life. You see, it is more generous or is more, uh, more of a blessing to give than it is to receive. So I want to ask you, now we've talked about blockages, right? We've talked about blood pressure. We've talked about rhythms of our heartbeat. We've talked about, uh, you know, the size of our heart. I want to ask you now to examine your own heart as we go into this series. And, and really compare the things we've talked about from Deuteronomy 15, specifically tie that in to whether or not you are accessing the blessed life that God wants you to have access to. How would your doctor describe the health of your heart? Not physically. How would the great physician describe the health of your faith? Do you need to work selfishness and greed out of your life? Do you need to reduce financial stress and remember that what you have isn't yours? Do you need to build a steady rhythm of generosity into your life? Do you need to express your gratitude to Jesus for all that he has done? Or what now is, is simply this, give generously. What happens when you give of your financial resources and when you give of your time and service to the church and when you use your talents to serve your community and those around you at work and, and within your, your, your circles, when you give generously of all of those things, what it's gonna do is it's going to help lower your blood pressure. Not physically, it might actually help physically, right? It's gonna help though, like work on the blood pressure of your, your faith heart. It's gonna help Get rid of the blockages where you're hanging on to things you were never meant to hang on to. It's going to help your heart beat in rhythm. It's going to help enlarge in your heart in a good way. You see, time, talent, and treasure, giving these things away is the key to living the blessed life that we're going to be talking about in this series. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd help each of us right now examine the health of our hearts. 
that we would be able to see very clearly where we are lacking health, where we're not accessing the blessed life that you have for us. We recognize that you call us into blessing. You say that when we obey your word, when we do things your way, when we, when we understand who you are and spend time meditating on your word and when we don't deviate to the right or to the left, we're gonna clearly see that you've called us to be generous. And your word is very clear that when we do that, that's when we have access to success in everything that we do. That's when we have access to the blessing you long to pour out. And that blessing doesn't come from us getting, it comes from us giving. So I pray that you would make us a generous and kind people who love the church that we're in and love the family that we're in and love the workplace and the neighborhood that we're in, love the community that you called us to live in. God, that we'd be generous with our hearts because we know that generosity is tied to our hearts and we long to be a generous people who experience the blessings that you have for us. God, we thank you and we love you and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.